Hello and welcome to our continuing series of science sharing webinars in Central Region. I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Matt Bunkers, who is the Sioux at WFO Rapid City. And he will be speaking on cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And uh, sounds like it's going to be a great webinar today. Matt, it's all yours. All right, well, thanks, John. Uh, I thought I'd put a picture up here since we don't meet face to face anymore. And at least those of you who haven't met me can see uh, who's talking to you and throw tomatoes at your screen if you so desire. Uh, I want to mention three things. First of all, this is a review of other people's work. I'm not presenting anything original. None of this is my research. It's just a synthesis of, of some papers that I read and wanted to bring that together. Uh, secondly, um, there's several offices that have a lot more uh, cyclic mesocyclones than we do here in Rapid City. So if you want to you know, you're, correct me on anything that I say or have some uh, insight to share based on your observations, uh, please go ahead and do that. And then finally, uh, Mike Myers, if you're on the call uh, at Grand Junction, you have my permission to shut your door, uh, turn out the lights, and take a nap for the next 30, 40 minutes, because this isn't terribly applicable to Western Colorado. I don't have any animation, so hopefully the, uh, the slides will show up pretty well here. I want to start, start out with uh, just an example of cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And this is uh, the upper right is a picture of uh, a couple of tornadoes northwest of Zurich, Kansas in June of 2005. The photo is uh, from Chuck Doswell. And uh, it actually, I, I retrieved it from a paper he, uh, Bob Johns and others just published on the Tri-State Tornado in the Electronic Journal. Anyway, it uh, just shows a pretty classic example. You have your, uh, your supercell here on the left, and I have the two points uh, where there, there were the tornadoes. You can see the, the hook here. Uh, the red or the southwest dot is where you had the, the tornado that was beginning to dissipate, and then the new one uh, to the northeast of that, which was just developing and strengthening. So pretty typical, classic example of, of what we're talking about here. Um, I, I was motivated by, by three people, actually. First, Phil Schumacher in Sioux Falls uh, and I were going back and forth about an interesting case he had in his area. Uh, Joshua Sheck up in Bismarck then uh, on another case, uh, another day, chatted with me about um, cyclic mesocyclones, left track tornadoes, and then Ken Cook finally sent me this. So to me, the moral of the story is if three people come to you independently and ask you about a topic, you better, A, know something about it, or B, if you don't know anything about it, you better find something out about it. So that finally uh, got me the critical mass to start looking into this. Before we uh, I, I talk about cyclic mesos, I think it's important to note what, what is not a cyclic um, mesocyclogenesis. And here we're talking about low-level mesocyclones. Um, there's a lot of these cases where I'm sure you've all seen it, where you have dual supercells or mid-level mesocyclones, uh, where you have two supercells fairly close to each other. The reflectivity may or may not be touching. Um, but this is not considered cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And I have two uh, examples on the following slides. Uh, in this first example, we're looking at uh, last June in southwestern South Dakota. And the storm motion was to the southeast. And if we look at the left here, there are actually two distinct supercells. And I've, I've drawn some outlines of the broad reflectivity of, of the storm. And so you can, you can infer that um, there's somewhat of a little uh, inflow notch in this northeastern one and then also the same thing on the southwestern one. And indeed, when you look at the velocity on the right, you see cyclonic shear circulations with both storms. They were persistent uh, temporally and spatially. So they were clearly two distinct supercells. Uh, eventually, the, the circulations went on to merge in the southeast, uh, to the southeast of this location and produced um, a significant tornado. Of course, if you've ever seen Morris Wiseman talk at COMAP, he, he's pretty good at drilling into your head that when that vorticity is additive. So when two vorticity centers of the same sign merge, it will actually strengthen. So, um, but that again, this is not cyclic um, tornado genesis or low-level mesocyclogenesis. This is two distinct uh, supercells, and it could be a, a talk and topic all uh, in an, in and of itself. In this next example, we're looking at a case, a uh, fairly famous case from the first vortex that Conrad Ziegler published in Monthly Weather Review, the so-called Graham-Newcastle storms. And again, uh, this is the storm oceans to the southeast. And this is a conceptual rendering of this case study. And this dashed uh, line outlines the, the broad reflectivity. So you can kind of see uh, one supercell to the southeast and then another uh, supercell uh, 
uh, to the northwest, and you can see the, the hook on that. So again, they're, they're somewhat connected in their reflectivity. The T's represent where there would be a tornado in, in the event that um, there was a tornado. Um, the, the typical supercell location in the, the hook area, and then another tornado on the uh, gust front. The only tornado in this case happened to be the one uh, with the northwestern supercell in the classical position. And so this wasn't cyclic tornado genesis. It was just two supercells very close together. And it's not always the rear one that produces tornadoes. Sometimes it's the front one, and there's, there can be interactions based on the outflow from the first one. Again, that's way beyond the scope of this talk, but I just wanted to indicate what it is not and what we're not talking about here. So uh, going back to the research, Don Burgess uh, put forth a conceptual model, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This was back in 1982. 12th Conference of Severe Local Storms. It's a, it's a classic model, and by and large, it stood the, the test of time. I'll just uh, go, go forward through this figure here and, and explain that. Uh, actually, this, this large box that we see is uh, a, a blow-up from what you see in this little inset here that tracks Tornado 1. So uh, initially, it started out with a, a supercell, mesocyclone core, and what they called low-level wind discontinuities. Essentially, you had your rear flank uh, gust front and then your forward flank uh, gust front. And with time, uh, you have a surge in RFD that begins to um, occlude. You d develop a tornado. Uh, that's what this gray track here is, a tornado. And eventually, uh, the storm continues to occlude. And eventually, it, it gets to a point where the first core, first mid-level mesocyclone turns left, and you have that familiar left turn to the to, uh, tornado track, and then you have discrete development of a new core to the right of the first mesocyclone. And then, because that's in a vorticity-rich environment, and goes on to produce a uh, tornado fairly rapidly after that. And so uh, Don Burgess and, and his co-authors looked at 41 mesos, about 25% of them, were considered multiple cores. So if you have two cores, you ended up with one cycle. Uh, typically, they had three cores, but they had one case that had six cores. And uh, the subsequent cores developed rapidly and over a large uh, depth of the atmosphere fairly rapidly. Um, and they noted that the RFD tends to wrap cyclonically around the meso and cuts off the inflow. Um, there's some ob observations that, that contradict that, but this was what they, they found in their study. Now, this was the one key figure from, from Don's paper. This, is, uh, this next slide shows the next key figure, shows the evolution, the average evolution of a three-core mesocyclone. So time goes from the left to the right. Uh, on the top, we see uh, the reflectivity extent uh, from, the, from zero up to 16 kilometers. So you see you know, broad development of the storm of pulsations in the storm top and then decay. For the mesocyclone core one, uh, you see relatively long organizing stage, long mature stage, and then um, uh, dissipating stage. And the red bars here indicate where you have the tornado. So you see with the first core, it fir first of all, it takes a while for the core to, uh, to develop, even though you have a thunderstorm. And then it takes a while for the tornado to develop. But subsequently, you have fairly rapid um, development of tornadoes with the next cores. Because as the first core is dissipating, the next core is already going through the organizing and mature stage. So rapid uh, subsequent tornado development. Typical lifetime of their first core was an hour and a half with uh, 45 minutes with subsequent cores. Don Burgess went on to state that uh, for long track tornadoes, there may be this delicate balance of forces in which the gust front doesn't get too far ahead or accelerate around uh, the uh, vortex. So he's kind of implying there's this balance between this inflow and outflow, and which was fairly um, prescient from him because a lot of the more recent research is suggesting that sort of thing. So um, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. So after Don Burgess, there was quite a bit of time that elapsed uh, before people looked at, at this in detail. Uh, Adlerman out of the OU was, uh, did some modeling work in 1999, uh, did some numerical simulations of this. And basically, what they came um, up with in their study was uh, classifying occlusion as five five steps. And so we'll go through this figure here. You have A, B, C, and so forth. And for each letter, you have a, a surface depiction and a mid-level depiction. And the surface I just have uh, highlighted here with a green box just so it stands out. And so in these pictures, you have the cyan, which represents updraft areas. You have red, which represents uh, positive vertical vorticity. The dark blue, 
would be a downdraft areas, and the yellow would be the, the reflectivity outline, and then the uh, black barb line, the uh, uh, rear flank uh, gust front and the forward flank uh, gust front. So anyway, at, at stage one, you have a supercell where the RFD uh, develops, and you're starting to get initial uh, mesocyclogenesis in the low levels. Uh, stage B, you see a pulse in the uh, mid-level updraft, and at the surface, the RFD continues to intensify. You see a hook uh, feature in the reflectivity field. Stage three, you have occlusion, a strong occlusion downdraft with the low-level mesocyclone being uh, separated from the, um, the, the uh, gust front occlusion point. And obviously, you could be having tornadoes uh, occurring at this time. Um, a little bit later, stage four, they have uh, decaying of the uh, mid-level updraft and the mesocyclone drifting rearward. But at the same time, there's some uh, new mesocyclogenesis occurring in the low levels at the uh, occlusion point of the gust front. And then finally, after that, the uh, old supercell is essentially gone. You have a new supercell, and the process starts all over again, again, fairly rapidly. Essentially, what this simulation from Adlerman and others did was reinforce the results uh, of Burgess. They also noted in their study uh, a paper that they referenced, the Starkow and Roos, I believe, that a little under a quarter percent of their tornadic storms had this cyclic behavior of intervals from 20 minutes to two hours, so quite a range there. A similar mean to what Don Burgess had shown. So a few years later then, Adlerman and Drogmeyer did another study on uh, cyclic mesocyclogenesis, and they just simply were looking at the sensitivity of model settings to cyclogenesis, uh, low, um, uh, cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And what they found were that just simply by changing the grid spacing, uh, things like microphysics, diffusion, surface friction, had dramatic effects on the number of cycles and the evolution of, of the cycling. This figure here just shows one example from their paper with uh, tracks of the surface vorticity for different grid spacings. So for example, at the two kilometer delta x, they had one low level mesocyclone you can see here in black, and that was it. When you went to one kilometer uh, delta x, you had three cycles. You had the C1 that, that did a loop like this, and then C2 that came over like, um, did another little loop, and then C3 that actually was moving southeast. And then at point five, you had, uh, again, very different kind of evolution. You had C1 and C2, which went along the same general path as just C1 did previously. So the, the moral of the story here is just little changes in the modeling produce dramatic differences in the cycling. And I've, I've dabbled with cloud modeling a little bit, and I've, I've noted the same thing, just small tweaks. Uh, sometimes even running it on a different uh, computer platform with the same settings can lead to different results. So that's, that's not terribly surprising to me. But it does illustrate the difficulty in, in getting to these kind of details. Well, then around the same time, or shortly after Adlerman, David Dowell and others came out with a study um, and I think Howie Bluestein was part of that. This was a Vortex case. I think it was the McLean, Texas case from the first Vortex. They uh, came up with modifications or suggested modifications to Don Burgess's model. The thing I really want to stress about this is it's only one case. So uh, it's hard to come up with a conceptual model from one case. But it was a highly observed case with aircraft and mesonet and, and radar and so forth. So they, they did come up with a conceptual model for that case, if you will. And they found, in this case, that the rear flank gust front didn't actually advance ahead of the mid-level meso. As uh, in the Don Burgess's model, they, they noted that the low-level meso tend to form at the gust front bulge and not the occlusion point, which would be back in here. So uh, that, that was one difference they noted. They also noted that the main updraft, mid-level updraft mesocyclone persisted and didn't go through a cycling. So even though you had low-level cycling going on, the main mid-level updraft continued to move uh, northeast. Another thing they noted that, in this case, the tornadoes moved to the left of the storm track for the entire time. It wasn't just as the, the tornado was occluding that it all, all of a sudden took that left turn. Um, but otherwise, they did note how the, uh, if you look on the right panel, we see that the dark gray was areas of updraft, a speckling as downdraft. So as you had one occluded a mesocyclone in the low levels. Another one was developing in the gust front region and fairly rapidly in a vorticity rich environment. A little bit later on as the first meso is occluding in the low levels, the second one. 
strengthening and it becomes tornadic. That's what these red lines represent here. And so that process can, can repeat itself fairly quickly. Uh, Dowell and uh, others went on to note that if, if the outflow is weak such that the gust front can remain beneath that updraft a lot, storm may be able to cycle fairly frequently because there isn't uh, this time required for the updraft to reform. But again, this is, this is based on one, one case. I actually think that the balance they're talking about may be a factor for the persistence of two, level, uh, two low level mesocyclones, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And that was a case that Phil Schumacher brought to my attention. Here's a part two of Dowell's, uh, David Dowell's paper. And here they, they stress the importance of low level updraft relative flow in, uh, in modulating the, uh, the cycling and the, the duration of the tornadoes. Now keep in mind, um, they have very highly detailed observations of this case. This is, you know, we can talk about this all we want and, and figure it out, but we, we can't, at the WFO level, measure this stuff. So we, cannot, we, we can develop our conceptual model about what we think could happen, but we can't get out there and measure this stuff. In this particular example here, if we look on the left, uh, and, and actually in both figures, these wider gray tracks are tornado tracks. So this first one here is tornado one, and then we see a gray track here, Tornado 2, and over here is Tornado 4. And I don't know what happened to Tornado 3. They, they dropped that from the figure. But at any rate, these black arrows represent uh, a, uh, the mean wind over the uh, lower portion of the atmosphere with about a 3 to 5 kilometer diameter circle centered on that tornado. So what they're essentially showing is that when the mean wind associated with where the tornado is matches that of the storm motion, which is to the northeast, the tornado tended to persist quite a while. With time, the low-level mean wind with the tornado uh, turned northwest, and so did the tornado track. And that one, of course, dissipated. And recall from Paul Markowski's uh, talk on Vortex 2 that, that I guess most of us heard uh, from the recording, there's the, the, uh, the uh, mid-level mesocyclone plays the role of that, that dynamic sucking. So if all of a sudden the low-level meso gets away from where that dynamic suck sucking is occurring, it would make sense that it would dissipate. Uh, shortly after Tornado 1, Tornado 2 developed here, and again, the low-level mean wind was carrying that tornado to the northwest, so again, it didn't last very long and dissipated. Tornado 4 was larger and much longer lasting, and they found that um, perhaps because of a surge in the rear flank uh, gust front or downdraft, it actually led to more of a northeast mean wind, which kept that tornado going along a track that matched the storm motion. So, Again, they, they stress the importance of this low-level updraft relative flow, which unfortunately we can't measure unless we have vortex on every storm that we have in our, our county warning areas. And then, so after that, a few years later, Adlerman and Drog, uh, Drogmeyer were back at it again with some modeling studies. Um, they had two key things that I gathered from the studies. The first one is that there are two types of cycling that, that they are proposing. On the top panels is the typical one or the one that we've been talking about where the uh, low-level meso uh, occludes and moves rearward, and then a new one forms fairly rapidly at the occlusion point. But they suggested another kind called non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis, where you have, you have your low-level meso as before, but instead of falling rearward it, or, uh, left of the uh, occlusion point, it actually stays with the, the uh, gust front and with time weakens and falls rear, rearward while discreetly a new low-level mesocyclone forms farther ahead. So in the end, you don't have the, the uh, mesocyclone veering or curving off to the left. You have it essentially just weakening and a new one forms out ahead of it discreetly. I've, I've actually seen this um, in our area. Unfortunately, I couldn't find or recall any dates uh, to pull up any radar examples of that. But I've seen it actually quite frequently in our area. Typically, it's not associated with storms that produce tornadoes, though. And you may see why here in just, just a minute. So this is the second main thing from um, Grogmeyer and Adlerman's paper. And of course, you look at this graph, and you're, you're screaming, like, what, what is all this stuff on here? And I'll, I'll try to make some sense out of that. Um, essentially, what they did is they m did some modeling as a function of the vertical wind shear. They changed the shape of the hodograph. They changed the strength of the shear and also the, the distribution of that shear within lower and middle parts of the, of the hodograph. So let's, let's look at this figure here. And on the x-axis, we have increasing shear from left to right, so relatively weak shear on the left and very strong shear on the right. The y-axis, we go from unidirectional hodographs to quarter uh, 
uh, curving to half circle to full circle, which we rarely see operationally. So let's take one path here and start on the lower left and just go across. So we see for a unidirectional hotograph, um, doesn't matter what strength the shear is for unidirectional hotograph, we see this non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And that, again, I said kind of makes sense of what I've seen in our area in western South Dakota. We tend to have more unidirectional hotographs, and I actually do see this non-occluding type of cyclic mesocyclogenesis relatively often. Now the next thing we're going to do is start here roughly in the middle and move upward. So we're at a, let's say, a moderate, moderate to somewhat strong shear category. And as you start out with the unidirectional hotograph, you have non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. As you get into the quarter to half circle hotographs, now we're looking at occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And then finally, once you get up to the half circle, according to the modeling results, they, they have steady non-cycling storms. Third thing we'll do is we'll start here on the left where you have a quarter to half circle hotographs and then move to the right. You see fairly quickly you're into the occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis, and as you go further to the right, eventually you get to steady non-cycling. So kind of synthesizing all of this into three take-home points from their study is that when you increase the shear, you tend to slow down the cycling, uh, which we, we noted here as you go from left to right across the, the typical hotograph that we see in our environments, which are quarter to half circle. Straight hotographs, according to their modeling studies, always have this non-occluding cyclic mesocyclogenesis. And then finally, no index, whether it be storm of helicity or bulk shear, uh, is actually useful in predicting cycling behavior, the frequency of it, and so forth. So it's tough to do operationally. And keep in mind, they did not look at thermodynamics such as boundary layer RH, LCL heights, and so forth. And I think there may be something to those, those variables. So now we're, we'll move on to a case um, closer to, well, in our neck of the woods, in the center region, by uh, Josh Baustead and Phil Schumacher from the 24th uh, SLS conference. And this is kind of what got me and, and Phil started talking about all this. And this was actually the day after the Greensburg tornado. And there were several tornadoes in southeastern South Dakota. And it was somewhat of an atypical cycling behavior. You start out where you see this low-level mesocyclone here, and it curved left, and a new one formed, and that makes sense. Um, so as the new one's going along, you actually see one form to the left of that. And I don't know if it was a continuation, you know, the previous circulation weakened and then re-strengthened or what. But what's interesting is you have two low-level mesos side by side persisting for, for fairly long, and then this one to the right actually weakens and one to the left continues. So not a classic case. And in some cases like this, you see where the tornado to the left can actually veer to the left and get out of the warning box. So that's something that, you know, that, that we need to consider. And that's, that was another reason that I think prompted Phil to look at this. Uh, it was a very strong shear environment, um, and which, is, which would suggest, that based on the, the previous studies, that uh, there would be a, a longer period between cycling, and maybe that has something to do with this. Maybe the uh, strong shear led to a better balance between inflow and outflow. We really don't know without observations, but I would speculate that this, this was some hybrid of occlusion where, where the, the meso to the left really didn't fully occlude and, and get out of the way of the storm and actually stayed relatively close to that, that mid-level updraft. So then um, the final research paper I believe that I looked at was for Mike French and others, and this included Howie Bluestein and David Dow, and they looked at a case from Vortex, uh, well, this wasn't from Vortex, it was some other project, Amarillo in, in 2003. And so we'll just, we'll, we'll just look at the figures here, and, and the storm ocean was generally to the east, northeast, and what we see in the upper left are low-level mesocyclone tracks, and these are ground relatives, so you can see uh, very, fairly short tracks, and they quickly moved north, northwest, and weakened. And eventually, with time, as they, they changed their direction, which is likely due to some outflow that developed in the rear flank, that's what the authors suggested, then the low-level mesos lasted a little bit longer as they were tracking closer to the storm ocean. If we look at the right here, um, you can see L1, low-level meso 1, on, on the rear flank. And with time, that was simply advecting rearward because the storm relative inflow uh, was reported to be very strong. It was actually overpowering the outflow. Um, and then a new low-level meso formed a little bit later that strengthened. And again, that moved uh, rearward. 
relative to the storm ocean and a new one developed on the, the front flank. But eventually, once the gust front strengthened and they had some sort of a quasi-balance, then they could get a longer-lasting uh, meso and, and tornado. So here's just, I got a couple examples from uh, the last couple of years. This is one from, I guess, the big outbreak last year. This was northwest of Wichita at uh, around 3Z. And you see a storm that had, um, obviously, a, a very strong, powerful supercell. It had, I don't know what the reported tornadoes were at this time, but it had two very well-defined uh, low-level mesocyclones, roughly three miles from each other. And I just noticed when I was reviewing this this morning, there's almost a suggestion of there's, there could have even been a third one here. I don't know if it could be bad velocity data out in here. Um, but these were persisting for roughly 30 minutes bef before they before a transition, before it would go through the handoff. And again, that's a fairly long time. And we can only speculate, but I believe it may be related to the very strong shear, such that there was somewhat of a balance. And so instead of this one that on the left that starts to occlude quickly turns left and dies, it actually hangs in there quite a while and can track nearly a parallel along with the new meso, low-level meso that form. Now, but let's just throw one monkey wrench into this. This is from April 27, 2011, the Tuscaloosa supercell and tornado. I see the very well-defined hook and, and uh, tornadic debris signature here. And this, when I looked at data from this day, there was relatively little cycling. They were very, very steady, and you didn't see these dual low-level mesos like in the previous example from Topeka. But what I did next then is plotted the photographs from both days, the Topeka um, last year in the 14th, and then Birmingham, 18Z, from the, the outbreak in April 27th. And I didn't do any translating. It's just simply the ground relative winds. And you see the photographs actually match up quite well. They both have quite strong low-level shear. There, yeah, there are some differences, in, but the, the quadrant, the shape, and all that, very similar, which leads me to believe there's more going on than, than just the shear. Uh, there's obviously terrain differences between Topeka and Birmingham, uh, the moisture profile could have been different. And even the time of day may have something to do with it. The, this was during daylight hours. The previous one was at 3Z. So where does, where does that leave us? Um, no surprise, and everybody knows this, the cycling is very difficult to predict. But I think there's a few things that we need to keep on, uh, that we can take into account. And actually, the, the, the most important thing, I think, is that if you're observing cycling, we need to watch out for the t tornadoes that turn left, and also the, the so-called handoffs between the, the left and the right turning tornado. And sometimes we'll get new tornadoes forming far to the right on that gust front, as in the, the David Dowell model. So what that would suggest is that um, you know, if, you wanna, if you're the kind of person that likes to have the, the big severe thunderstorm warning, and then you put a little tornado warning in, you know, box in the out just to track that tornado, you're kind of living on the edge a little bit dangerously because you could have a turn tornado curving left out of your box. You could have a new one developing discreetly in the gust front to the right. So that's, to me, that's the biggest key out of all this since we don't really have a good handle on the periodicity of this and when and how they may form. Um, that, that really comes into play in, in drawing polygons. And of course, all of you in the farther southeast of Rapid City have a better handle on this than I do. The, uh, Strong low-level shear and the curvature uh, is suggestive of a slower occluding process to the cyclic mesocyclones based on the modeling and also uh, the, the examples we saw from Phil and uh, from Wichita where you had two low-level mesocyclones persisting for quite some time in a stronger shear environment. So maybe there is this some sort of uh, inflow-outflow, the balance that's occurring that's leading to these longer-lived uh, tornadoes, which again, we don't have the instrumentation to, uh, to be able to detect that. So uh, and that, that's what I speculate was going on in the Sioux Falls and, and Wichita cases, which again kind of got me prompted to, to looking into this. So here's all the papers that I went, went through to, to review this. I have the Don Burgess's highlight in blue. And, and if you remember, uh, most of us probably remember the E.F. Hutton commercial. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Well, when Don Burgess writes and when Don Burgess speaks, people should listen because he, he does pretty darn good work and his model from back in 1982 holds pretty darn well to, uh, to the state. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Matt. Uh, any questions?
Hello, this is uh, Ryan Husted in Goodland, Kansas. Um, I had a question. Uh, you kept referring to, um, you know, maybe strong shear is causing these mesos to cycle slower. Um, you know, you brought up the April 27th Tuscaloosa tornado. I was actually working that day uh, in Memphis. Um, my question was, what about storm motion? Because um, those storms on that day were moving 60 to 70 miles an hour, and in the Memphis area, we had a tornado uh, F3, I think we rated it. That was on the ground for probably 65 miles, and then it cycled, and it put down the F5 in Smithville, and that one lasted 30 miles or so, um, you know, both on the ground 45 minutes to an hour or so at least. Uh, so I was wondering if the storm motion of the storms might be a factor in helping with that inflow, outflow balance. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's a real, that's a real good point, point, Ryan. I didn't I did look into that, but I do that, believe that could be the case. case. Um, uh, Dan Miller Dan brought up a good point to me, uh, I guess, last week on the storms in North Texas back on the 15th of May, and they were moving fairly slow, and they had some relatively frequent and erratic cycling-type behavior. So I don't have the answer to that, but it certainly makes sense to me uh, what you said. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was watching those North Texas storms, too, and... That Granberry tornado was only on the ground five minutes, maybe like three miles or so. So, um, all right, thanks for the answer. Yeah. Hey, Matt, it's Jim Ledoux. Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Oh, pretty good. Yep. I was really so intrigued. I, you know, I, I actually didn't read the uh, second Evelyn paper and uh, looking at that. I remember coming across for it, and I never read into the details about the uh, you know, how they uh, how they did that modeling study with the non including and concluding cyclic mesos, and I was wondering if they had any uh, or if you read about what kind of microphysics scheme they had. That I don't recall. I, I'd I'd have to defer you to, to the paper. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. Um, the, the takeaway was just making small variations can can have a big effect, and of course, yeah, whether or not they right. had warm rain or had ice processes. I assume they tried both, but I'd have to go back and look at that detail. Yeah, because I know, uh, you know Dan Dawson recently is really pouring into, you know, the impacts of the microphysics and, and what they do to storms. Yeah, so. yeah I'm familiar with um, some of his work, and do, do you think that's related to the, the cyclic process? I would imagine, you know, just thinking about, you know, how it modulates the strength of the cold pool, and if you have, you know, if, it, if one model is, is just doing warm rain and another one's doing ice, or, you know, one's doing ice, but then all the ice gets carried away, and then leaving a weak cold pool instead of strong, I could imagine the outcome be pretty different. Yeah, and I think that just drives home the point of how, how difficult it is to predict the, the periodicity of the cycling and, you know, Adlerman basically just looked at the, the shear profile, so, you know, ignoring the, the thermodynamics and, and the variations of the, the microphysics, um, you know. And obviously, terrain, I think terrain may have something to do with it as well, what part of, you know, flat or hilly that could have an effect. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. I know uh, Texas a couple weeks ago had, you know, the Fort Worth office had a little bit of a difficulty with um, their cyclic mesocyclone. I remember, oh, was that big one that, it was just south of Fort Worth, produced the F4, and it moved straight left of the, of the supercell track and went right out of there, right out of the uh, warning polygon. They, they put a new one up just in the nick of time. Yeah, that, that's an interesting observation, and that fits with what David Dowell showed in their, their um, I think it was the part two of the 2002 paper, was that the low-level advection kind of really drives where that tornado is moving. It's a big driver of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, as I've been chasing before, where I'm, I'm on the, uh, the, you know, the tornadic circulation, and the upper level meso is moving away from me, and when that tornado finally dissipates, I have to go a long ways just to catch up with the storm, and it, it seemed to be separating, if you will, from from the parent storm. So, um, you know, what's driving that low level advection seems to be key, but again, it's it's something you can't measure; you have to react to from a, a warning forecaster standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Matt and well, Jim. I'll break off for now. Thanks, Jim. Matt and for Jim, this is Dan in Wichita, and um, kind of going to continue that conversation. I know I've seen several cases where it's almost like there's some kind of 
effect where I see like a, a zipper effect where there's not a mesocyclone produced tornado. Um, you know, there's a tornadic circulation with a cycling effect, but then I start seeing several instances of almost like a land spout along the, that advection line. I've, I've visually seen this a couple times out chasing. Um, it's, it's a kind of a, you know, you've got the, you've got the mesocyclone tornado, and then you start, it seems with these cyclic storms, you start seeing these almost little satellite land spouts along the, the flanking line, and depending on what kind of advection is going on. So I don't, it's all kind of not sure what's going on there, but I've seen that visually several times. Yeah, Suzanne, that might fit with what David Dow was talking about with additional tornadoes forming along the gust front surge. So, you know, I guess that would make sense. They'd, they'd be more of the so-called land spout variety, but maybe not all of them, but if they're forming where you have a lot of um, vertical vorticity already present along that boundary. But, of course, that, that just makes things all the tougher again if you have a small polygon because you have these things developing outside of your box. Any last questions from Matt? Matt, thank you very much for your presentation today. We sure appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you everyone thank for joining us today and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you and have a